punches are not made, they are born. He was born a puncher. It's just my nature, you know I mean? It, I mean, to reach for you and take your heart or your blood or your spleen or your liver. The only place he's ever, he, he ever used to find any peace in the world was in the ring. I want to have a perfect fight. I want to be the best fighter. I felt like Mike was kidnapped into the Don King cult and brainwashed. Don is a master of finding a person's weakness. The fight is on. King used Tyson's sex life and the women around him to control him. There he is. By nature, I'm wild. Regardless, it's my mentality, that's the way I am. You know, even though I'm, I'm subdued, I just, you know, I, mean, I have a lot of energy. Mike Tyson is more than wild. Mike Tyson is the most brutal man to ever step into a professional boxing ring. He's the only man to ever be disqualified in a championship bout for biting his opponent. Not once, but twice. His actions sent thousands of fans racing out of the arena in fear. I was inside the casino and freaking people just started, there was shots fired, people just started running out. The Nevada State Athletic Commission revoked Tyson's license for a period of one year. Time to reconsider whether or not he was emotionally fit to fight again. Larry Merchant covered Tyson almost from his beginnings. All fighters previous, previously of his type in the heavyweight division, meaning Dempsey, Marciano, and Fraser, had short, blazing careers. That kind of style does not allow a fighter to have a very long career as Joe Lewis did, as Muhammad Ali did, as Larry Holmes did. So even giving him the best of intentions, the greatest of will to change over, there's a serious question of whether it can be done. Tyson grew up in Brooklyn. His father abandoned him. His mother couldn't control him. Everything was so hostile. It was, there was never a, a subtle moment there. It was always hostile. Cops always stopping. You know what I mean? Amalans always coming to pick up somebody. Guns always going off. People are getting stabbed. Windows are being broken. Very, very hostile. You know, we were excited. We thought it was something. You know what I mean? Just to watch these guys shooting out one another. It was somewhat on um, um, watching John Wayne shoot it out of watch um, some old Humphrey Bogart, Edward G. Robinson movies, and you're watching these guys shoot out, and you're looking, and you say, wow, and this is happening in real life. By the time he was eight, he was a street punk trying to survive. It was so exciting. Me and your world is so vastly different. You could never understand the, the action and the excitement of it all. I mean, the cunningness, the, you know what I mean? To be able to outsmart somebody, it was a big thrill. To be, not just to go out there and beat the guy up and slam him on the ground and take his wallet. To, out, to outsmart them, to outtime them, to outthink them, even though they know that you're a crook. When you're on the bus or when you're walking in the check cashing place or the grocery store, they know to watch you and you still outsmart them. Like most people would think, um, well, she knows me, she's, she's on to me, I'm gonna walk away, but just to, still watch them, watch them, and they think they know, and then they make one mistake, and you outsmart them, and they have their wallet. See, I'm not a professional crook, but when I was young, I just wanted to outthink an idea that you'll go back to your friend and say, you had to see the way I did this. See your friend, you say, you had to see this. You know, you had to see, I should get an Academy Awards for this, you say. And it was just, it does, I don't care. I, just, I had a great time, you know what I mean? It was a great learning experience in life. Uh, he was a teenage mugger and predator. He had 38 arrests as a juvenile. By the time he was 13, Tyson was sentenced to a juvenile center in upstate New York where his luck changed when he was brought to the attention of a boxing man by the name of Customato. Customato was a legendary boxing figure who had led champions like Jose Torres and Floyd Patterson to world titles. Customato rescued him from a life of crime in prison, uh, gave him an opportunity, developed his boxing skills. Tyson was 12. He was very shy. He looks very strong. He looked too small and a little bit too fat to make any projection about him. Customato brought two trainers into Tyson's life, Teddy Atlas and Kevin Rooney. 
I met Tyson uh, in Catskill, New York with Customato. I was up there training fighters. I was training all the fighters for Customato. I was training at the time when Bobby Stewart, who was a correction officer in uh, a youth prison near Albany, called up Cus and asked him if I would take a look at this young kid named Mike Tyson. It was a gentleman named Bobby Stewart, who was an ex-fighter and knew Cus. Cus had helped him a great deal, and I wanted to be a boxer. I watched him box with the kids. When he found out that Stewart was a former fighter, which he was, pro and amateur, uh, Stewart showed him a couple of things and Tyson became very energized and very excited about the prospect of maybe learning how to box. And when he found out he was friendly with Cus, Tyson was excited that he might have an opportunity to come in and meet Cus. In his 70s, when he met Tyson, D'Amato believed he'd found the kid who once again could put Cus on a championship track. We trained them, myself and, and Teddy, at the beginning. We trained them steadily until finally started to get boxing, and then he developed the, the ability to slip punches and so forth. When he got to the point of slipping punches, we had a difficult time getting people to box with him because he proved to be a very hard punch with both hands. Tyson, was, he was like a sponge. He just absorbed everything that Cus had to teach him, you know, the head movement, throwing the punches with, with bad intentions, and, the right, the proper snap, and I, rem I recall Mike, you know, you know, practicing for, for long, sustained periods of time, 10, 15 minutes in the mirror, just throwing like one, the right upper card or left hook, just over and over and over. Cus had an extensive uh, film at the house of the old fighters, Dempsey, Armstrong, Robinson, and uh, Tyson used to watch them all the time. Henry Armstrong's style here is typical of him. Head down on the chest of his opponent. That's it, there you go. Now you got, again, again. Who's the last guy to stop? Time. Very good, that's what I mean. I want to do something that no fight I've ever done violently. And I want to do something, I don't want to actually kill somebody. You know? I mean, for things like Jack Dempsey broke people's eye sockets. You know, I mean, that's to me, and that's that's a high. That's, I mean, it's to see that guy did this. The trainers worked on Tyson's boxing skills. Cus used Jose Torres as a role model. Cus Diamato said, "This kid may become the youngest heavyweight champion of the world." He wanted to impress us. He knew exactly why he was there. He was there to audition to be able to change his life, maybe, to move somewhere else after he got out of prison. Cus watched me, Cus was pleased, I guess. And he said, you have too much talent, you know what I mean? And he said, you're a good kid, but if you go back to Brooklyn, you're only gonna get yourself in trouble. And from that point on, he adopted me. Come on, man. Come on, man. Look at that part right there. See him? Oh, that's great. Oh, great. Look at the other one coming. Right with him. Oh, look at this bird, man. He's unbelievable. Unbelievable. That's the best thing. Look at him. Unbelievable. Tyson raised pigeons at Cuss's house, a pursuit he discovered as a child growing up in Brooklyn. But Tyson was not content to only play with his pigeons. Tyson was wild. He used to disappear. Cuss threw Tyson out of the house in front of me, get out of here. Uh, that was not one point. And another point, he asked Tyson out to fight with him. Uh, there was a time, I remember one time when there was an argument between Tyson and Cuss. And Tyson, Cuss went outside, come here. You know, you, you, you wanna be, you wanna be a tough guy, come here. And, and, I, and I, we're gonna fight. And Cuss was very serious. And Tyson, of course, he laughed and walked away. Well, he had problems. He got thrown out of the school. A lot of the stuff, quite honestly, was kept quiet uh, because the image was important. You know, the kid and the old man. That was a great image. You know, that could really sell. The kid and the old man. Well, not exactly. At least when the kid wanted to play. He used to uh, leave for the weekends to see his mother in Brooklyn. Uh, he was supposed to leave on Saturday and come back on Sunday, and sometimes he stay lost for three or four or five days. And Cus used to come to the city, and he used to call me other times, and I used to go 
over Bed Stuy looking for uh, Brownsville, looking for Tyson all over the place. And sometimes we found him, most times we did not. And I was wild. I never had the opportunity because I focused most of my life. I'm sure most of the stories you hear are not, not as accurate. But you know what I mean? Of course. I mean, I was interested in women. Whatever troubles Tyson was encountering outside the ring, it was not affecting the natural killer instinct inside. With Cuss and Teddy Atlas's guidance, Tyson had beaten every amateur opponent, and in 1982, he defended his Junior Olympics title. His reputation had preceded him. The year before, some of the less developed fighters intentionally lost their matches, terrified of facing Tyson and risking serious physical injury. While other fighters may have seen him as a vicious animal to be feared and avoided, Tyson showed another side of himself before stepping into the ring for the championship match. He broke down before the bout, giving voice to a familiar lament, his fear that if he lost, no one would love him. Better fighters than you're ever gonna fight here. I mean, it's always hard, but I mean, it's a long way, remember? Yeah. You're the champ, fight smart and like a tiger in town. Tyson has a great overhand right. Brown carries his left hand low. We'll see whether the two match up. There's the right hand. There's the left. A right He's left hand. He's, He's, He's got him in the corner. He's working on him. Right the head goes up. He's going down. Another right back to the body by Tyson. Very, very strong boxer, Tyson. Tell you. Very, very strong. Brown has taken some vicious punishment and held on. He's still really in has. there. I don't think he's There's ready. another right by Tyson. He's just a left right. He's giving up. The towel's coming in. Look at old Tyson jump on the rope. Having disposed of the amateurs, Tyson turned professional. The beginning of Mike Tyson's career was guided perfectly from the trainers, the training, the promoting, the fights acquired for Mike Tyson. Here was a man that sometimes fought twice a month. Unbelievable. It's so hard for a manager to get two fights a month for a fighter, never mind the amount of fights that they got for Team Tyson. Team Tyson was the perfect team for boxing. And the next thing you know, Mike Tyson was like the hottest up and coming fighter that we had seen since the uh, young Cassius Clay. A uh, 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 Rocky Marciano. I mean, they were putting him in, or uh, Joe Lewis, they were putting him in that in that category. Because, because why? Because he was knocking guys out. He, he was knocking guys out. Every time he threw the punch, he threw with bad intentions. And he wasn't getting hit. Several months after turning pro, Tyson was hit with the hardest blow of his career when his adoptive father and mentor, Customato, died of pneumonia. No one was certain Tyson could continue. Jim Jacobs assumed the place in Tyson's heart that had been held by Customato. The friend, the mentor, the replacement for the father that he never knew. Jacobs told Mike, win the title for Cus. Cus died one year before Tyson became a champion. And Cus was saying publicly that he was still alive, probably, because of Tyson. Jim Jacobs, who was working with Tyson, and Bill Caton, they, they had, a, they had a, an association, they, uh, they took over. He suffered in silence. That, you know, I think that Tyson turned the the hurtfulness and the sorrow into some vicious anger, and he, because and he, he started knocking guys, he was knocking guys out in the gym, and I think that he 
actually turned inward and, and had it work for him. That's what I believe happened. In uh, 1984, 85, 86, and most of 87, uh, Mike lived in my apartment here in Manhattan, and he would sleep on the couch. And then he'd become a top 10 fighter. And then he became the number one contender. And then he became heavyweight champion of the world. So to come out of my bedroom in the morning, and there on the couch is the heavyweight champion of the world. And my, my friend, is, it's like having Willie Mays or Mickey Mantle sleeping on your couch the most incredible feeling in the world. But all during that time period, he was a terrific kid. That was a right to the body and an uppercut to the head. And Burbick is... Tyson, at the age of 20, became Cuss's dream, the youngest heavyweight champion of the world. Having conquered the division, Tyson turned his attentions to a beautiful young actress, the star of a popular television sitcom, Robin Givens. At the beginning, I was for the idea of Tyson marrying Robin Gibbons, because Tyson was getting too wild. He began to get attention from women in, in the street, and he was going crazy with women. And I felt that if he married one woman, he would stick but on the control of one woman, and that would have been much better for him. I didn't care about the woman. But in this case, I thought that Robin Gibbons was a good woman. Before I get married, you know I mean, like I say, I was a young kid, 15, 16, 17, 18. 19, you know, making a great deal of money, very famous, more than making money, I was very famous. Yeah. I mean, and I was wild, I never had the opportunity because I focused most of my life. I'm sure most of the stories you hear are not, not as accurate, perhaps, I don't know what they all are, but you know what I mean, of course, I mean, I was interested in women. Robin was a very, you know, seemed to be a very sweet girl, and I was delighted with the fact that he was getting married. I thought it'd be good for Mike, and... Uh, but as soon as she got married, she called up and said, she's Mrs. Mike Tyson, I'm taking over. I want to see all the books and all the records. In 1988, once Mike got married, uh, Robin uh, Givens and Ruth, of course, were very interested in taking over Mike's career. It became very obvious when we were in Tokyo for the Tubbs fight. We're flying home from Japan. I think it was a 13-hour flight. And Robin Givens gets up and announces to Bill Caton that I'm, the, I'm Mrs. Tyson now and everything's got to go through me. So right then, that was the first sign that they were looking to take Tyson over. It was reported to us here in New York that Robin and Ruth were at the bank already claiming Mike's accounts and telling Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton that they're, they're taking over. And Robin went on record to Bill and Jim saying, she's Mrs. Mike Tyson, she's taking over. And it turned out to be a mistake, you know. Uh, it turned out to be a mistake because it was like a game. The marriage and then the relationship with Tyson and the mother. Tyson barely had time for a honeymoon before tragedy struck his life once again. Tyson's mentor and co-manager, Jim Jacobs, who'd been fighting leukemia for eight years, died on March 23, 1988. To the young champion, it was a shocking and unexpected event. Jacobs had been the replacement for Customato and Tyson's emotional universe, and he'd been kept in the dark about his surrogate father's illness. Then Jim Jacobs died when Mike was 21, uh, and that created the opening, the opportunity for uh, Don King to move in on a very confused 21-year-old kid and manipulate him into becoming part of Don King's uh, empire. With his new marriage and the pressure of fame and fortune pressing relentlessly on him, Tyson needed a father figure now, now more than ever. By the time June 1988 rolled around, Tyson's personal and professional lives were in disarray. His manager and mentor, Jim Jacobs, was gone and the recently wedded champ was being pulled and manipulated by several opposing forces. In one corner, there was Robin Givens and her mother, Ruth Roper, who were fighting for control of the champ's fortune. On the opposing side, Bill Caton, the manager who had helped make Tyson a multi-millionaire and international celebrity. And then, there was Don King, the flamboyant, spike-haired promoter the new force in Tyson's life. This is the high road. I'm not mad at anybody 
I have no axe to grind with anyone. All I want to do is to present to America and the world the best in boxing in a camaraderie, conviviality type of setting. I'm a dreamer, and I'm a big dreamer. And when I start, start dreaming, I get in a lot of trouble. I just want to announce that we've just heard that this is the greatest live gate in the history of professional sports, $12.3 million. By the time Tyson stepped back into the ring to defend his title against Michael Spinks, his life outside the ring was on the ropes. Just 10 days before the bout in Atlantic City, Robin Givens and her mother Ruth Roper went public with tales of beatings by Tyson. And on the day of the fight, Tyson sued his manager Bill Caton, claiming Caton had been dishonest in his handlings of the champ's finances. It's no pity case. It's things that have all millions and millions and millions and not just tens and twenties, you know what I mean? Hundreds of millions of dollars, you know what I mean? And what I did was when he asked to have all the records, I had a complete readout made of every dollar in, every dollar out from the day we took over when Mike turned pro, and I sent that to the lawyer, and that was the end of it, lawyer. He was more than satisfied. We never heard another word from that lawyer. Even though King kept saying that, that we stole money, the fact is that we paid Mike everything, overpaid Mike, from the very, and never recouped the money that we paid during his uh, amateur career. This is, this is serious, you know what I mean? People don't understand. They don't understand the contracts and what we had for the future. People, you know, this is where a great deal of money. Robin and Ruth decided that while the Spinks fight was going to be taking place, they wanted to make sure that the moment the Spinks fight was over and Mike had had his payday of $23 million, they wanted to make sure that they were in charge. And they did a very good job of convincing Mike that everything that had been done for him up until that point was not in his best interest, that the monies that were generated by Mike, he was getting cheated out of, and all of the things that they told him, given information to them by Don King, worked. And Mike genuinely believed that everything that had been done for him was not in his best interest. How are you doing, friend? Who do you think is going to win? Mike. <laughs> Billed as Tyson Spinks once and for all, and seen by odds makers as Tyson's biggest challenge yet, this bout had far more drama going on outside the ring than it did inside. Big moment for me, big moment for boxing. Biggest fight in boxing history by far. Michael Spinks has ever been down in a professional fight. Tyson disposed of Spinks in 91 seconds. Tyson may have left Atlantic City with his title intact, but the drama surrounding the fight would continue. Don was able to grab Mike, bring him out to Cleveland, keep him in Cleveland, until he was able to convince Mike that he was in his best interest. Whatever the story was, whatever I'm sure Mike needed at that time, whether it was wine, women, or song, Don got him. To be able to keep him in Cleveland, to give Don the time it took for Don to start pitching the stories. And Don is the greatest pitcher of all time. He did make some moves about closing off bank accounts so that the women could not uh, put checks against him, which were in Mike's interest. But they weren't being done for Mike. They were being done for Don King to cement his association with him. This lawsuit is brought by Mike Tyson. There were charges and counter charges. Eventually, Donald Trump announced the deal that left Caton as manager King as promoter. Mike asked me and his family asked me whether or not I'd help them in terms of representation, in terms of helping him to solve some of the problems that you're going to have as a 21-year-old fighter. And I said I would do that. And uh, I, I'd like to see him be successful so that at the age of 30 or 35, when he's ready to stop, he doesn't have to worry about anything. History has said that oftentimes people or boxers or fighters or just athletes who have made millions turn around years later and wonder where it went. Uh, Joe Lewis had to fight an extra fight sure. for financial reasons. 
Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has to go an extra season for financial reasons. I never want my husband to be in a position to have to fight another fight. I want him to step into the ring as often as he wants because he wants to, because he enjoys it. Never for financial reasons. And as much money as Michael makes, he should never have to do it for financial reasons. I'm running my show. I don't have to fight for anybody. He's employed by me. And it seems like it was the other way around when I was employed by him. And the contract that we had and agreed, which I trusted them, and I had to write a, it was basically like a, a serving contract. I fight when and where and whoever they said or whatever, and that, I feel, wasn't justified rightly. And I'm very pleased the matter is resolved. I'm happy to be working with Mike Tyson, who I am absolutely confident history will decide was the greatest heavyweight of all time. He's got strong power over his own destiny. He's got strong control over his own destiny. And I think that Mike and Bill working together are going to be really something over the next few years. I'm going to take a couple, six, eight weeks off and relax. I'm making the decisions, like I said, now, and it's good the first time making my own decision. I decide I'm not going to fight. If I would have never been involved with then my girlfriend, then my wife, Robin Givens, I would have never been aware and my eyes would have never been open to what was happening. And I'd like to commend my wife, who I love so much. And thank you. Despite the public announcements, the struggle for control of Tyson's career would continue to unfold in the coming years, as with the turmoil in his personal life. During the summer of 88, uh, after the contract between Bill Caton and Mike Tyson was renegotiated with Robin and Ruth, everything was pretty calm for about uh, six, eight, six, six to eight weeks. And then there was the blow-up between Mike Tyson and Robin Givens at the mansion in Bernardsville. In a nationally televised interview, Robin Givens told Barbara Walters that Tyson was a manic depressive, a charge that would later prove groundless. She also renewed her claim that Tyson beat her. Several days later, people were summoned to Tyson's mansion in New Jersey on a domestic disturbance call. And shortly after that, Robin Givens filed for divorce. With Robin gone, Tyson turned to his promoter, Don King. I knew Mike Tyson from 1980 to 1988. Once he was kidnapped into this Don King cult, he never returned one of my phone calls. I don't know if my messages were ever given to him. It was as if Mike Tyson went into a cult. And the cult leaders made him break off ties to all of his old friends. Don King ingratiates himself with fighters by appealing to their worst angels instead of their better angels and allowing them to do what they please uh, and in that way to to gain their loyalty. Kevin Rooney was a wonderful trainer for him. Kevin Rooney loved him uh, but Don King made him fire Kevin Rooney and I think the day Tyson fired Kevin Rooney there was a cap put on Mike Tyson's development as a fighter. He did not develop any more beyond that date. He was never in tip-top shape for any fight after he fired Rooney. He stopped moving his head. He began to accept clinches. He started to jab less. You could see that, uh, that under Don King, not only did his character and morals decline and erode, his boxing technique began to decline and erode because he no longer had Kevin Rooney or Teddy Atlas. He didn't want to submit himself as an athlete to anyone who could have any authority, to anyone who could say no. And he surrounded himself, uh, bought, bought friends with the money he made and surrounded himself with, with semi-professionals uh, and allowed all of this, the distractions that come with, with fame and fortune to impose themselves on him. If the odds makers were aware of Tyson's flagging commitment to his boxing, it was not reflected in their handicapping of Tyson's bout in Tokyo against James Buster Douglas in February of 1990. Tyson goes over. So about two weeks before the fight, he realizes that you know he's like 20 pounds overweight. He goes on a crash diet. He got down to, I think, it was like 225. Tyson was a 42 to 1 favorite. Before the fight, rumors had swirled about Tyson's mental and physical state. He'd been knocked down in sparring and didn't seem focused during training. He'd faced adversity in his personal life from day one, but never had his demons affected him in the ring. For the first time, the greatest champion of his generation had lost control in the one place 
he had always seemed to be able to maintain it. The bell rang, and I could see Tyson wasn't himself, and he wasn't, he wasn't in shape. So he, I guess he figured that, well, maybe this guy's going to fall down if I look mean at him. So Tyson looked mean at him. Douglas said, okay, and he started throwing a couple of jabs. He started landing, first round, second round, third round. Now all of a sudden, Buster Douglas went from being uh, what we call a scared fighter to a brave fighter. And once that happens, that once you go from being nervous to being real brave, you don't go back to being nervous. You stay real brave. And he just, he just, he paced him, Mike. I mean, he, just, he gave him a beat. We'll finish things in oh, the uppercut. What an uppercut by Douglas. We acknowledge the fact that Buster Douglas put on a brilliant performance. The man was uh, magnificent. And it indicated, as I've told you many times before in many of the press conferences that we have had, that the greatness of boxing is the unpredictability of it. Fighters lose. Most of your writers, the mature writers here, they're a lot older. They've been around a lot longer than I have in the fight business. They've seen fighters better than I lose. These things happen. The only thing I'm asking for from the champion now is just the rematch. I'll be okay. Tyson was humiliated. He had never taken such a public beating. Now more than ever, he needed approval. And more than ever, he turned to sex. Rudy Gonzalez was Mike Tyson's chauffeur and later a bodyguard and personal aide. Rudy Gonzalez was at Tyson's side constantly. He was a first-hand observer of Tyson's sex life. Our life with, with, with Tyson, with women, was simple. They were always around. They were always trying to claw themselves into the car and trying to get with him. And, and it becomes confusing. King knew this. King used Tyson's sex life and the women around him to control him. Tyson didn't run down the, the, the streets running around trying to grab people. Basically, women would put themselves in his arms and, 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 and actually melt and fold and twist in certain ways that he would react to like any man would. July 18, 1991, Tyson met Desiree Washington, a Miss Black America contestant at a pageant rehearsal in Indianapolis. She accompanied him back to his hotel room in the early morning hours. Three days later, Washington filed a complaint with police alleging that Tyson raped her. Back up! Back up! Back up! Come on, back up! All the way! All the way! Excuse me, please. These charges are in connection with the sexual assault. This was the greatest crisis of his young life. His freedom and reputation were at stake. The situation that occurred was just, you know, it's totally ridiculous, and I didn't hurt anyone or do anything to anyone. And you know, I love women. You know what I mean? My mother's a woman. I respect them as well. And of course, you know what I mean? Every time I f trust one and get involved with one in a certain way like this, something happens. So I'm confused. So I'm just, I'm just lost from the whole issue that happened today. Surprisingly, None of the Team Tyson men who had stood with him at Customato's early in his career were there. Now, only one man stood at Tyson's side, Don King. Excuse us, please. Excuse us. Excuse us. Due process is really all we are looking for, and if due process is, is exhibited here, justice will prevail. Still hoping to fight Holyfield? Right now, I would say due process. Give him his constitutional right. Mike Tyson is now synonymous to due process. The Constitution of this great United States. We are not arguing whether he's guilty or innocent. We are saying that due process take his court. I wasn't in the hotel room. Uh, you never know what actually happened. Tyson felt a kind of en entitlement with the world, that whatever he wanted, he could get. And uh, he was sort of out of control and, and like a lot of star athletes and entertainers didn't feel that uh, the rules applied to him and found out that they did. Uh, the press has been a little overzealous in giving the man a scathing indictment by innuendo, insinuation, accusation, you know what I mean? And so he's been castigated. 
Thank Were you, you surprised by anything you heard from the defense in their final? No. There aren't many, you know, when you discover, like we discovered in this case, you're not going to have very many surprises. What time did they actually start deliberating? I did get all the time. One o'clock. Uh, about five minutes ago, we received word from the jury that we, they have reached a verdict. After nine hours of deliberations, the Indianapolis jury found Tyson guilty. We did not come to a conclusion until the conclusion of our deliberation. All we wanted to do, and I think we did a very good job of that, we wanted to be sure of what we did, and we wanted to be fair. We knew that it was going to be like this because it's Indiana. Well, I think it was probably a very fair verdict. And then what I want to say is while we're confident of the verdict, and while we are, uh, we remain steadfast in our uh, posture versus the crime that was committed, we do have a sense of compassion for any defendant who's convicted of a crime and faces the uncertain future that this young man does. Serving a six-year term at the Indiana Youth Center, Tyson was back in the setting he knew all too well from his days as a street punk. But once again, he fought back. He became a Muslim, had his sentence cut in half for good behavior, and on March 25, 1995, he was a free man. Tyson the Muslim was expected to fire Don King, but he did not. To the surprise of boxing fans, Tyson signed a new contract with Don King worth tens of millions of dollars. The fight is on. The reason he went with King when he got out of jail was very simple. King was the only man on this planet who could take a man out of jail, a convicted rapist, and do a deal with one of the biggest companies in this country, MGM a six or eight fight deal, I can't remember exactly which, for $30 million a fight. And the first fight he had was against Pete McNeely of all time. I wish Don King managed me. Because King was uh, clever enough to put together the best financial package and make the best guarantee to him. All the other guys were saying, I'll do great things for you. King was able to lay a deal out on the table that said, you're going to make 100 or $150 million if you, if you go with me. It was a business decision. It soon became clear that Don King had once again cast a spell on Tyson. The spike-haired promoter was in charge of the ex-con, ex-champs comeback. From Amboy Street in Brooklyn, and a part of the community, the former world champion of the world, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. I think that Don King has Tyson's number, you know, intellectually, the same way uh, Holyfield has Tyson's number uh, pugilistically. Tyson might have as much on King as King had on Tyson. So there was a kind of mutually assured destruction <laughs> potential between them. Uh, I think it was the money and the emotion. He felt safer with King. King had power in the boxing world. Uh, these other guys would just talk. Don King knows Tyson. He knows how to, to persuade Tyson. He knows how to dissuade Tyson. He, he manipulates Tyson outside the ring like a little boy. Tyson's comeback was plagued by controversy from the start. And while the fight set up by Don King might not have been what most boxing observers would call competitive, they were immensely profitable. Tyson's status as the biggest draw in boxing was once again secure. He's selling tickets now the way he always did, but I think it's for a different reason. Where once it was to watch this tremendous boxer, now I think there's an odd sort of circus around him that uh, people want, what's going to happen this time? And, and that sells. That sells in America. While Tyson wasn't the dominant pugilist he'd been in his prime, he was still a dangerous fighter with too much speed and punching power for almost every other ranked heavyweight. Tyson quickly retained the WBC and WBA titles with victories over Frank Bruno and Bruce Seldon. Finally, Tyson was going to get his long sought after bout against Evander Holyfield.
and because they thought Holyfield was completely washed up as a fighter, and they thought that his name would attract a big audience and restore Tyson's own name. Otherwise, they never would have taken that fight. If they thought that Holyfield could still fight, they would not have taken the fight. Tyson Holyfield, years in the making. So I'm just looking forward to winning. My main objective is just to win. I truly believe that the fight will be tough until uh, I convince him that you know, I, I am the man. Turned out to be a giant letdown. Tyson was dominated by Holyfield, and the fight had to be stopped in the 11th round. For only the second time in his professional career, the fighter once thought unbeatable had suffered defeat. Tyson wasn't in good shape, and he was believing his press clippings, I guess, and uh, Holyfield proceeded to give him another beating. As it turned out, Holyfield exposed Tyson, exposed the fact that he had gone way back as a fighter, and exposed the fact that he was basically a bully in the ring, and that if you stood up to him, that he would come apart. On June 28, 1997, Tyson stepped into the ring with Evander Holyfield once again. It would be a day of infamy for boxing, and for Tyson as well. The uncontrolled demons which had followed him through most of his life would on this day slip between the ropes, creating one of the ugliest moments in boxing history. Well, I didn't know what I was seeing at first. Uh, then when I realized he bit his ears, it occurred to me that this was the guy who quit, who was looking to get out of a fight. And then I, I don't really think that was the case. I think he was frustrated. He realized he found someone he couldn't intimidate, he couldn't bully, he couldn't beat. And he just reacted in frustration and uh, bailed out. Referee Mills Lane warned Tyson. But seconds later, Tyson did the unthinkable again. This time, Lane disqualified him. I think he understood he was losing the fight and was going to lose the fight because everything unfolded exactly as in the first fight, including a headbutt, including being muscled around. He understood that he wasn't going to win this fight, that Holyfield still had his number. There was no way for him to prevail. He landed some big punches that did not have any effect on Holyfield. I think a, a, a feeling deep inside himself that he was going to lose again, and he didn't want to get knocked out, so this was a... Uh, uh, an exit out of the fight without getting knocked out. I mean, you don't have to think that you are losing the fight. What you have to think is that this guy is not falling after I'm hitting him with my best shot. And in, I think it was in the third round that Tyson was having his best round when he decided to beat him uh, in the year. He was, Tyson was without a doubt, he was, uh, he lacked confidence to win. He knew that he could not beat this guy. He was sure that it was impossible to beat this guy. So he said, you know, he beat his ear. Tyson's corners showed their colors. A melee erupted in the ring. An army of police stormed the ring to restore order. Well, it was a melee. I mean, it was a melee from the word go, uh, not just in the ring, but in the casino afterwards. The whole place was... Uh was chaotic and uh, it was a fitting end to, to that whole comeback. It was very nasty. There were people in the crowd, of course, incensed by what they'd seen. There were fights breaking out all over the place. And I'm not surprised that MGM have sort of turned their backs on boxing. While Holyfield was rushed to the hospital with a towel placed over his near severed ear to stop it from falling off, the fighter once known as the baddest man on the planet took the long walk from the ring back to his dressing room. Tyson and his entourage were pelted with cups and bottles and whatever else the outraged crowd could find to throw at them. I saw him actually leaving the hotel property and where some guy yelled at him, uh, called him a loser, uh, and Tyson actually tried to get out of the car and get at the guy and he was restrained. So, I mean, the, the level of frustration uh, was dialed up pretty high and it didn't go down. I was inside the casino and freaking people just started doing shots fired. The media had a field day. Pictures of the bite were splashed across the front pages of virtually every newspaper in the world. Tyson was condemned, ridiculed, and sports writers were near unanimous in declaring that he should never be allowed to fight again.
I saw what millions of people around the world saw, and I've been a boxing writer for more than 30 years. I was horrified at what I saw. That's nothing to do with boxing. That's what happens out in the street, unfortunately. And if I had my way, I would have banned Tyson. The State of Nevada Athletic Commission held the same opinion. On July 11, 1997, they revoked Tyson's license to box. From rape to revocation, the greatest fighter of his generation had become the living, breathing epitome of every requiem for a heavyweight story ever told. I'm not bigger than boxing. Boxing doesn't need me. But I can survive without boxing, just like boxing can survive without me. Tyson wasn't finished. He knew he could earn a living. He began by turning to wrestling. I would like to announce that Mike Tyson will be, in effect, the enforcer. He will be on the outside of the ring in somewhat of a guest referee capacity. There is precedent for this. If uh, some of you recall all the way back to Russell Mania 1 in Madison Square Garden, Muhammad Ali was in a similar capacity. And with that in mind, I believe we have some videotape footage of Ali. Mike knows that other fighters in the history of boxing who were on, on their last legs financially had to do the same thing. And at that point in their careers, it was a very much of a blow to their, their legend. I respect what you've done in the boxing world, but when you step in this ring, you're messing with Stone Cold Steve Austin, and that's something you don't do. I think it's sad wrestling is not a sport. Uh, one of the great films about boxing, Requiem for Heavyweight, ends with a, with a fighter becoming a wrestler. Uh, Joe Lewis, the great, great Joe Lewis, ended up as a wrestling referee. To see him now at almost age 32 involved in, in wrestling, which is, you know, vaudeville, burlesque, is, is a little sad. March 6, 1998. While waiting to regain his boxing license, Tyson broke with Don King, suing King for $100 million, alleging that King had cheated him out of tens of millions of dollars over more than a decade. Mike Tyson himself, over the years, has said he knew that people were robbing him. Uh, he's contributed to, uh, to that by staying with people that he knew would rob him. He didn't understand money. A lot of it was coming in and going out. And like a lot of young people, he thought it would never end. If I would have been a nice guy and kept quiet and continued to let people take advantage of me, I, I would have been, been kept writing, oh, he's brilliant, he's a magnificent fighter, he's such a you know, he's scholar, he's talked to us, he handled us like a scholar. Once we stand up and we fight for ourselves and we're prepared to challenge anybody, don't care how much money they have, don't care how much power they have, because it's right. While Tyson's professional life continued to proceed in the harsh glare of the media spotlight, he quietly married Dr. Monica Turner. Turner was a regular visitor while Tyson was in prison. The couple have avoided the limelight and have started a family. One of the questions I've been asked is, can he, can he change? I have no doubt that he wants to change. I suspect he'll try to surround himself with people who will try to help him change. I don't know whether he will really permit himself to submit to a, a strong trainer and really go back to doing what he did it when he was young and loved it and had great ambition. And then there's the other question of whether even if he has all of that, whether at his age he can change. Mike Tyson's life has been a series of monumental highs and devastating lows. His, in many ways, is the quintessential story of modern American celebrity. His face has been splashed on magazines and newspapers around the world as the triumphant athlete and the disgraced champion. He's a living legend. His story, a work in progress. The final acts are still being written. Oh, he, he is a victim, but he's also responsible for his own actions. Uh, Don King didn't uh, rape Desiree Washington. Don King didn't bite Evander Hollifield's ear. Don King 
was a terrible influence on Tyson, and he put Tyson into an environment of criminals and drug dealers and pimps uh, and ex-cons who I think brought out the worst in Mike Tyson, but Mike has to face the responsibility for his own actions. Is Tyson destined to suffer the fate of so many fighters before him? Will he fade from public view, slipping silently back into the streets from which he came? I always thought, like, when you're a famous fighter, I used to watch the fighters, they always had women. I thought that was the key, to always be the fancy women, had the cars, and you know, I mean, to be very flashy and luxurious, you know what I mean? But then again, all those fighters, they wind up broke, died in furnished apartments. Legendary fighters, peerless fighters, which no man could match them at their prime, wind up broke, died, you know what I mean, with no money. All the girls they had left them. All the people that say that you're the best champ, I'm your friend, left them. They died alone. I grew up with Cuss, you know what I mean? And we never had a value for money, you know what I mean? Cuss always, yeah. Cuss' main objectives, you know what I mean? When I, he said, once, you, this is what Cuss said, money's a fourth sense of security, you know what I mean? Don't put a whole bunch of trust in it, you know what I mean? It helps you get out of a lot of problems, but you know what I mean? Don't rely on it, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Have a great deal of independence, you know what I mean? The main objective is to be your own man, to be independent. And I mean, once you have a family and you have a wife, there's no longer you. You're what your family comes first, regardless of the situation. Your career doesn't come before your your family. Your family comes first. You know what I mean?